Former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton once said, if you want to know whether Islam, democracy, modernity, and women's rights can coexist, go to Indonesia. But that nation has recently witnessed frequent violent attacks against some of the country's religious minorities. Is Indonesia not the pluralistic paradise once described? Joining us now with his view, Andreas Harsono. He is a researcher with Human Rights Watch, and we welcome you to the province of Ontario Thank and to so our much. studio. Thank, Thank you, you for so being much. here. So Let's just remind everybody the nature of Indonesia as it breaks down by religion. And I'll ask the control room to bring these numbers up. In Indonesia, almost 90% of the population follows Islam. Uh, Christians make up almost 10%, Hindu, almost 3%, Buddhist, less than 1%, and others about a half a percent. Now in this country, Andreas, of 250 million people, how many religions in total are there? Well, according to the government data, there are more than 400 religions. 400, so these are the main ones, but there are plenty more. Because of the blasphemy law in 1965, only six are officially recognized. Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. How did they get to be officially recognized and the other ones not? Because there was the blasphemy law. If you have a blasphemy law, the next question is, who do you protect? If you cannot uh, blasphem, uh, you know, being blasphemous, and the question is, there should be religion that to be protected and those that are not to be protected. And they came up with this sixth religion. Is atheism recognized? Uh, legally, it is not clear. But you can be accused as committing blasphemy if you are declaring yourself as an atheist. I see. Now, everybody carries an identity card in Indonesia? Yes. And your religion is noted on the card? Yes. If it's one of the major religions? Yes. And if it's not? If not, legally, you can say it is a blank. You can say that I don't want my, my you know, for instance, I am a Baha'i. I want Baha'i to be uh, printed on my religious uh, uh, column or Jew Judaism, but they say you cannot. So, so you can you're Baha'i, but you can't have that on your identity card? No, you cannot. Because it's not one of the officially sanctioned religions? No, no. And you think that's unfair? It is discriminatory against the 400 other smaller religions, including Shia, Shia Muslim, including Ahmadiyya Muslim. In certain places in Indonesia, if you are a Shia Muslim, you cannot put Islam on your ID card because Shia is not categorized as Islam. But you need the ID card, and if it is blank, it is dangerous for, you know, for various reasons. So they put Christian on their ID card. Shia Muslims put Christian on the identity card. We have example of woman wearing headscarf, obviously a Muslim, but check at her ID card, Christian. Because why would it be so dangerous to have something else on there? Well, because uh, there is a growing of narrow-mindedness. There is a growing... Uh, intolerance? Yeah, intolerance, discriminations over the last uh, eight years in Indonesia. And we also see hundreds of cases of religious violence against minorities. Andres, you've had an interesting religious journey yourself, right? You're a Baha'i now. What were you? Well, I'm a Chinese. I was born in a, a Confucian family. I was born in 1965. But three years later, Confucianism was banned. So we cannot be a Confucian. If you are declaring yourself to be a Confucian, you know, you are committing blasphemy against the government. So you were Confucian, then you changed to what? My parents became Christian. My mother became even newborn Christian. But they sent me, because Sunday school were banned, they sent me to Catholic school. So I became a Catholic. I was baptized as a Catholic. And then I married, a, my wife is a Muslim, I married a Muslim w w lady, and I became a Muslim. Sunni? Uh, she is a Nadatul Ulama, okay. Muslim. All right. And how did you go from Islam to Baha'i? No, no, I'm not a Baha'i. I'm oh, you're just, not? I'm just, no. I'm, I'm, well, I'm not practicing now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's quite a journey. It Four is. Four different religions over the course of a lifetime. Oh, yeah. Uh, in some countries, you will be beheaded for that. Do you, have you found yourself that you have been discriminated against because of your religious changes? Well, at the same time, I'm known as someone who defends religious freedom, so it is kind of 
you know, people know that I know uh, this business, so I'm okay. Hmm. You've had actually other troubles besides religion. You have, uh, what, what was your name when you were born? Uh, my name was Ong Chiliang. In Chinese Malay, name. Chinese name. And why aren't you using that name today? Because uh, after General Suharto came to power, everything Chinese was banned. Chinese character, you cannot see Chinese characters in Jakarta when I, when I was born. Uh, movie uh, names, so we have to change our name. And you changed it to Andreas? Uh, a village official told my father that he should change the family name into Harsono. So it was given at that village office. Mm -hmm. And my mother became a Christian. She gave me the first name of Andreas. So you have neither the same name nor the same religion that you were born with. I think so. Does that bother you? Well, if they took your identity, you have to deal with that. You have to face that. It is something, something, I'm not the only one, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of people, millions yeah. of people suffer this kind of thing. Your organization, Human Rights, did a video about some of the problems that are going on in Indonesia right mm -hmm. now. I'd like to play a short snippet of that and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Roll tape, please. Human Rights Watch research in Indonesia shows a very worrying uptick in religious intolerance, which is being expressed in acts of intimidation, harassment, threats, and deadly violence. These incidents are occurring with alarming frequency uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes even on a daily basis. Why do you think this is happening now? Because there is a belief among Indonesian elite that rather than promoting religious freedom, they believe that it should be religious harmony. And because of their belief, their convictions, they, they introduced a number of new regulations. The first one was the House of Worship uh, Building Permit Regulations in 2006. They also introduced uh, a number of regulations which will send anyone who propagate Ahmadiyya faith or Shia faith to five years jail term. Hmm. Are they the two religions that are the most discriminated against? Uh, in Indonesia, among the Muslim minorities, yes, Shia and Ahmadiyya. But also we have uh, the Sufi, you know, but it is not as, because the number is small, not as severe as among the Ahmadiyya and the Shia. But among non-Muslim minorities, the Christian are mostly discriminated against. How difficult was it for Human Rights Watch to get that video out of the country to the rest of the world? Well, the video was taken by an Ahmadiyya man, but he was afraid to broadcast it. So he asked Human Rights Watch some advice, what to do. Uh, we advised them to give it to Indonesian TV station, but TV station refused to air it. So we gave them to international TVs, Associated Press, ABC, NHK, Al Jazeera, and they did broadcast the video. The question is, how is about internally, domestic Indonesian audience? And uh, I did that on YouTube. So it has not actually played on Indonesian television, it's only been on YouTube? Yes. So you don't really know if anybody's seen it in Indonesia? Well, they see some part of the, the violence, but again, Indonesian TVs do self-censorship against that kind of footage. So this is quite a concern because Indonesian domestic audience is slower in getting realizing that there is a big problem caused by the current government over religious freedom in Indonesia. People, I gather, know you are associated with that video. Yes. Have you had uh, security problems as a result? Oh, yeah. They, they threaten. Uh, they send threatening messages, uh, email, uh, phone call. Like they even, what? Oh, they fall like they will kill me. They say that I'm an enemy of Islam, that they, I am tarnishing the good name of Islam in Indonesia, those kind of stuff. That worry you? Oh, they flatten my car tires, four tires at the same time, uh, call my son, call my wife. What do you do about that? Uh, things like this is 
is happening. This is our business. Human rights is not something not sweaty. Uh, this kind of dirty stuff happens. So, well, we have to wait until things calm down. The most important thing is this is really happening. This is not a fiction. We have the names right, we have the name of the village right, we have the names of the perpetrators right, the victims are there, the hospital are there, the medical records are there, and of course there is a video. You mentioned the perpetrators. Yeah. Who's doing this? Most of them are Sunni militants. Most of them are organized under organizations like the Islamic Defenders Front. And most of them are directly or indirectly related to the Indonesian Ulama Council. Are there so-called terrorist organizations operating out of Indonesia that are part of this? Oh, no, no. They are not terrorists. They are doing violence against minorities. Uh, the terrorist is a different matter. The Indonesian Ulama Council also denounce terrorism, suicide bombers, you know, that kind of stuff. Hmm. You heard my line off the top from Hillary Clinton. You remember that line? Yes. If you want to see all of these wonderful things coexisting peacefully, come to Indonesia. I think Hillary regret of saying that because if she come to Jakarta today, she won't see what she said back in 2007. Why do you think this has happened? Well, because people like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, David Cameron, Angela Merkel, they like to, to do business and they want to be seen as, as soft on Indonesia. They want to do things behind the scene and that's why they see something nice which is unfortunately inaccurate about what is happening on the ground. But lately I learned that they don't do it anymore. Although, you know, kind of still trying to be diplomatic, which is obvious, but it is not happening. Uh, a statement like Hillary Clinton is not happening again. Let's just understand a bit of the history because I, I think many people remember when it was Suharno and Sukarno, the, the country was a mess yeah. and there were, um, well, terrible killings and, and it was a, Indonesia was a tragic place for a long time. But then we were told that Indonesia had straightened itself out for a good long time. Mm -hmm. So what changed? Why, why did Indonesia go from a place that looked like it was getting its act together to a place where they are persecuting religious minorities all of a sudden? What happened is after the fall of President Suharto in 1998, of course there are openings. Political spaces are open. But at the same time, civil liberties are not strengthened. We have electoral democracy. People can vote freely, but there are no uh, protections for freedom of speech, freedom of religions, of course, freedom of faith, freedom of expressions. And then this is a rule of the majority, the tyranny of majority. Uh, politicians, of course, like to talk about religions because it is the, the easiest thing to get vote, rather than talking about budget, talking about various regulations, talking about foreign policy, defense, etc., which is complicated. But talking about religion is easy. Hmm. Okay, you've mentioned government there, and that leads us into the next part of our discussion, and we want to get into some discussion about that, but you've got a clip again from your documentary. Let's watch that first, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. In August 2012, the Shia community in Sampang, East Java, was attacked by a group of militants who burnt down more than 50 houses. One man was burnt to death and another was seriously injured as a result of this attack. The local police and government officials on the scene did nothing to prevent the violence which ensued, even though the local Shia community had warned the police and had pleaded for intervention. Were you saying you were arrested in connection with that video? Uh, I was there interviewing Shia villagers uh, a year before that, and the Sunni militants were not happy with, with our presence. They threatened to, you know, to act against us, and the police intervened, and we were arrested for three nights. Three nights in jail? Uh, in police detention. In police detention. How were you treated while you were in detention? It was okay. It was okay. We were all released, two of us released, because of course we did nothing wrong. Right. Uh, freedom of religion is guaranteed under the Constitution of Indonesia, is it not? Yes. Uh, the Constitution explicitly says religious freedom, but the government right. now introduced a new concept. It is called religious harmony. 
it means that the majority, the minority things is going into considerations. And in 2006, the government set up what they call Religious Harmony Forum. Hundreds of them all over Indonesia, every regency, every province. The purpose is to maintain more or less the percentage. You talk about the percentage in the beginning of, of the show. Mm -hmm. That is the, 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 the mantra of the government. Islam, certain percents, keep it that way. House of worship should represent more or less the percentage of the Muslim or the Christian. And that's why making a house of worship for the minority right now is extremely difficult. There are hundreds of churches being closed down over the last eight years. Well, we pointed out off the top there's about 87% of uh, Indonesians are Muslim. Does that mean 87% of the mosques or of the houses of worship in Indonesia are well, mosques? According to the government data, there are mosques are only 78%. Meanwhile, Muslim are 88% according to government data. So they want more mosques. They said it should be boosted. Meanwhile, uh, the Christian is about 10%. Meanwhile, churches are about 19%. There are too many churches. So they're literally going around and shutting down churches. Well, they don't shut down churches, but they make it difficult for new churches to be established. And of <laughs> course, there are hundreds of, of, of churches that are being closed down. Uh, of course, it is ridiculous because Christians have different denominations. You yes. know, the, the, the Presbyterian do not pray in a Catholic church and vice versa. Inside Indonesia, churches are also divided in accordance to language group, ethnic groups. Hmm. If I speak Batak, for instance, it is an ethnic group, of course I don't pray in a Javanese speaking church. This How is like going to a French church, French language church, or a Dutch language church. I see. How many languages do you speak? Seven. Seven languages. Yeah. English and what else? Well, the others are mostly local dialects inside In, Indonesia. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your president, whose yeah. nickname I guess is SPA? Yeah. Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. I got pretty close. <laughs> How has he reacted to all of this religious violence? Well, he vows that there should be no tolerance against violence made in the name of religion and president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, even raised the issue of Shia against, uh, you know, against Shia in Indonesia with President SB, SBY. And he promised that he will take actions. He said that before the Islamic New Year last year, all the Shia displaced villages will be returned to their palace. But until now, they are still in, in their displacement camp. Hmm. Uh, he talked, but he does not deliver what he talked. He doesn't walk what he talk. I gather you're over here in Canada because you had some meetings with our ambassador for religious freedom. This is interesting. And it, how did the meetings go? It was a great one. Uh, I think he knows his business. He, he impressed me so much with his understanding of, about the issue. He's going to travel to Jakarta next month. And he knows that there are discriminations against Christian, Ahmadiyya, Shia, Sufi inside Indonesia. He told me that Indonesia is a top priority country uh, on Canadian foreign policy in terms of religious freedom. Hmm. Do you think that he or Canada are able to actually affect any positive change here? It is not easy. Uh, you know, I know the budget of that office is about $2.5 million, Canadian dollars. Uh, I told him that the budget of Indonesia Ministry of Religious Freedom is $8.8 .8 billion. 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 8.8 .8 billion. So that's a bit of a David and Goliath contest. Although, you know, numbers, uh, figures is not that important. You can do a lot of big things uh, with a small budget. But I just would like to put on the table that you are dealing with one agency of four uh, agencies, government agencies, which facilitate discrimination in Asia. And one agency alone has $8 billion on their pocket. Andreas, uh, we're really grateful you came into TVO tonight and shared some of your history on this subject with us. Thank you very much. That's Andreas Harsono, Indonesia researcher with Human Rights Watch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.